Dan, okay. count to the 10 real quick. Sorry? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Count to 10. Fuck, I have to... Let me no. take my socks off. <laughs> <laughs> Third Degree the Podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. There's a new addition to the Since 96 collection. The new era Dallas Burn hat is now available, and it is lovely. This Saturday, May the 8th, all North Texas SC gear purchased will come with free shipping. And do not forget, ever forget, that you, the Third Degree, the pod listener, receive 25% off when you use the code Third Degree at checkout over on the deliciously awesome Soccer90.com. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Buy a t-shirt. Welcome to another edition of Third Degree, the podcast. Hello. How you doing? My name is Peter, and I'm with one, my good English mate, Dan Crook. Hi, Peter. How's it going? And, and have you bought a deliciously awesome FC Dallas Curious t-shirt yourself? Uh, yet to be admitted publicly. And, of course, your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, editor, founder of Third Degree, the awesome Buzz Carrot. Come in, Buzz. Hello, Peter. Calling in today from Globe Life Park because I really want to see Matthew Corcoran play. <laughs> Uh, I have not yet bought a one of those awesome new FC Dallas Curious t-shirts, which you can go buy at the Third Degree store. Since I am the originator of said phrase, I didn't know if maybe I would bestowed one, but uh, probably not. I'll have to go uh, pony up the dough and get one for myself. I, I'll be happy to kick you back the $2 that I make. <laughs> the two dollars because otherwise i'm not involved in the process <laughs> yes uh if you don't know what we're talking about buzz did add a fc dallas curious designed shirt uh to the store and i think it's kind of awesome and didn't you update the uh l train hype train shirt oh yeah no i made a, a number 16 version of the l train shirt just because some people were like he wears that doesn't wear nine anymore so i was like okay so here's the 16 the nine is still available if you prefer the classic nine number all right, so a couple of weeks ago, Dallas at home opens the season tying Colorado, and there's a slight level of freakout. They then go to San Jose and get dropped hard, and then the freakout really happens. And then just a few days ago, Portland comes to town, and Dallas bombs them hard, and now everything's all good and well in the world of FC Dallas. Right, Buzz? We're all feeling like winning an MLS Cup this year. Well... When you play a team that's that does a full rotation, Dallas did what you're supposed to do. I think the thing that everyone feels really positive about, of course, is it wasn't just a win. It was a big win. And the formation change sort of solidified a lot of the difficulties and changed a lot of things that people were worried about. So, yay, everyone's on a gigantic, huge emotional high, roller coaster high. But as always, one game, good or bad, is not the end, of, end all, beat all. And we should take everything with a grain of salt and try and be smooth about it and but it is a positive, positive game, and there's lots of positives to take from it. Yeah, I, my biggest takeaway, and it happened, well, by the way, that opening goal like two minutes into the game is one of the finest team goals I've ever seen this team, I've seen this club score in its entire 26-year history. That was about as perfect as it gets. And it was very immediate within the first five minutes that this team just simply looks more comfortable, more natural, and more at ease when it's playing a 4 man back line versus a three center back line, uh, back line. Yeah. You know, this is the formation, basically the four, three, three, depending on how you rotate the midfield that this club's played since Oscar was coach, you know, for most of his run and now under Lucci for two seasons going into this third season. So the guys that are left and the guys that have all come in are all ingrained in this system. In fact, the, it's the system that FC Dallas plays all the way through the entire Academy, all the way down as young as age group as you can field 11 players. This is the same system they play, the same formation they play, the same tactics they play. So even if you're a guy that's relatively new to the club as a homegrown, you've been playing this thing for 10 years, you know? So the comfort level is there. And more specifically with having the extra guy back in midfield, you're not getting out man three to two and the guys aren't trucking through the midfield. Like it's a picnic and a parade. So everything about it was better and, and more obviously fits this team and the roster and the players they have. 
I, I can't even imagine why you would go back to the three four three. Lucci, of course, is insistent that they will at some point. So, you know, it, it's going to be something you're going to have to get used to. Hopefully, they can come better at it because right now this formation is light years ahead of the other one. With uh, Hedges being hurt, Dan, and Brisson starting again, you know, I said a few weeks ago that I, I wasn't the biggest Brisson fan, but I have to admit I'm warming up to him quickly because he's suddenly, I don't know what happened, I don't know what clicked, but he's playing uh, with a, a little less of the, um, I don't know, lack of caution that he had been when he first got here, and he's been playing really well, and uh, I'll be darned, a little, there was a little bit of freak out when people heard that he may be leaving for a green card, but now that he's not, uh, I, I, I think uh, there's a real concern about who the two starting center backs are at this point for this team. What a great problem to have. I mean, it's, it's funny. There's almost a bit of garden snake about him. You know, uh, always been a fiery guy, puts his body on the line, but it just wasn't clicking at all. Uh, although with him, it was certainly more so, at least we understand it, in, probably in practice than, uh, than in game. And uh, yeah, getting the start of the season, he's he's looked fantastic in, in all three games. I think he's... Um, aside from maybe the first game, I think he's he's uh, he's definitely looked as looked the part uh, compared to two fantastic defenders in uh, Martinez and Hedges, and yeah, I, I definitely I, you know I, I see Lucci's uh, problem of of feeling like he needs to get all three of them in the game, um, he just needs to uh, to learn to do it when it doesn't harm the the overall team. Buzz, if uh, if Hedges is healthy, and this kind of goes back to maybe Lucci's thinking at the beginning, are Brisson, Hedges, and Martinez his best players in his roster? Uh, I think you can include Ricarte in that conversation, but those four, and, and, and the way Brian Acosta has started the year, those five really are the, the best players on the team right now. I know I keep adding players in, but... Um, you know, it, as Dan says, this is going to be a difficult process for Lucci in the sense that he has three really good players for two spots in this formation, and one of them is going to have to sit. Now, with Hedges being 31, you know, some load management among those three guys, and with two of them playing any given game, actually will really benefit this team. Like, over the course of the season, if you have a third guy that can play in there and start in there, and so each guy only plays 20 to 25 games, you're going to get to the playoffs a heck of a lot healthier. Now there's also, of course, the idea of consistency, but all three of those dudes are going to play enough and they're all good enough that I don't think that's going to be an issue there. It's not like a guy's what they're, they're never going to get in all of a sudden they need to play or something. So um, this is actually the kind of problem that you both hate to have and love to have because all three of those guys are playing at the top of their game aside from hedges who we were, I was thinking, boy, is he finally starting to lose a step? Oh, he wasn't. He just rolled his ankle. So it was all perfectly understandable, and, and he's going to have three talented center backs in his hands, which is why I'm sure he was going with the three-man back line because these three of his best five players are all three of the, in center backs. Let's put them all in the game, except, of course, that the rest of the formation isn't ready for it. So I'm just going to flat out ask you, if all three are healthy for this game against Houston, who are you starting between the two if you're playing a two, uh, just two center backs? Uh, if, if all three are healthy, I would – play the same lineup, play Martinez and Brisson because a, it would give hedges a little more rest and B it would help cement the idea that if you play well, you get to keep your spot. So, which is always something you want to emphasize, particularly early in the season. All right, so Steve Davis during the broadcast, uh, or at least after the broadcast, because uh, it wasn't brought, it wasn't a broadcast; it was a video stream because it wasn't on television or cable. Um, sent out a tweet reminding everybody that Brisson was potentially leaving the country for green card purposes. It turned out later that that's now not happening. But Dan, since you are the resident uh, immigrant uh, on the podcast, could you please explain what that whole process is like and why he'll have to leave for a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I know uh, a couple of people in the in the uh, the Discord channel for the patrons uh, mentioned, you know, will I get a, an extra international spot if that was going to happen? Uh, when you're dealing with the uh, USCIS, the uh, people in charge of immigration, uh, nobody knows anything. You may wait a month, you may wait a couple of years. Uh, so, you know, at no point could FC Dallas go into anything thinking. 
Okay, Brisson is going to get his green card on this date. He's going to leave for Brazil then, so that he can get it all processed in Brazil at the uh, at the consulate in, you know, I assume in Rio or or somewhere like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, now it's now it's a bonus. They will unfortunately lose him for a little bit for uh, a time where they've got to go through that whole uh, red tape in Brazil to give to. Uh, add the visa to his passport and all that other stuff. So that's um, in June, it looks like? Yeah, I, mean, yes. that was, I think what Garrett uh, put out. Yeah, it's going to be in June, That according to the team. I mean, Garrett works for the team, so I can't imagine he would have put out bad info on that regard. All right, so while we're talking about players who seem to be in redemption mode, let's spend some time about uh, Mr. Brian Acosta, a player that I think universally over the last... 107 episodes or eight episodes we've generally panned pretty hard but uh, he's come good this year yeah he's actually playing the best soccer I think over the first three games of this year that he's played since he joined the team and now Lucci you remember in the offseason he mentioned that Brian uh, was looking for a redemption that he felt like he'd let the team down last year with the amount of time he was injured and the amount of time he missed and even his performances and the biggest criticism we have of him is blasting those balls over the top. And I think he's done that once maybe this year. Somebody sent a clip of one. But for the most part, he's cut that out to a certain great extent. And, and beyond that, uh, partic- it was particularly noticeable against the Timbers. He's just become really active and, and like almost double the amount of ground he's covering. And he's covering up for teammates. He's making recovery runs. Now, he, he did get worn out, and he missed – uh, well, everybody in the midfield missed the close down on the one Portland goal with that dude, um, Eric Williams, Williams whatever. Yeah. yeah, just dribbled right through the midfield and nobody stopped the ball. That he's not a natural six, so we'll give him a little bit of a benefit of the doubt there. But um, other than the fact that he wore out at the end of the game, he honestly is playing, in my opinion, the best soccer of his whole Dallas career. And if you can look at any stat you want to, and he's doing tremendous work, whether it be passing percentage or whether it be progressions with the ball, whether it be. Um, uh, pressures, you know, the the guy's just playing some terrific soccer right now. Now we can also have another discussion about, is he doing enough for what he's getting paid as a DP? I can't necessarily say that's true, but just on this performance alone, he's playing the best ball he's, he's got here. So what about this uh, midfield three with Acosta, Ricarte and Tanner? There was some uh, kind of in-game shifting between the three of them. Uh, how did, how do you feel that worked out over the course of the 90 minutes? Yeah, now in training, it was 100% clear that Tanner was the six, and uh, at least the day I watched, and Acosta was the eight, and McCarty was an eight. And then the team didn't distribute it that way. The team wrote, wrote it out where Acosta and Tanner were both playing a double pivot, but that's not what I saw in the field. I saw Tanner start as a six, and then about, I want to say 20, 25 minutes in, they flipped him, and Acosta became the six, and Tanner moved up to play eight. I didn't really like Tanner as a six. He, um, you know, neither he or Acosta are hard tacklers. They're going to play six by positioning, by covering the zones, covering for guys that are overlapping and overloading, getting in the right spot, turning the play, which they didn't do on the one goal. So I honestly like it better if those guys would play a double pivot with leaving Ricarte a little higher. Not that you want Ricarte as a 10, but, um, Really, you're going to see both of those guys drop in and out. I, I definitely liked it better when Acosta was sitting in than when Tanner was sitting in. Uh, based on what I saw today, which we'll get to later, it's, I think you're going to kind of see that that trio is going to continue for a while, I think. Uh, let's see. So overall, with the, with the three, what is it about that combination of that three, Dan, that you think just seems to make this whole thing flow so much better? And, and again, and to be fair, how much of what we saw in the performance was the fact that Portland rolled out essentially a B team because this was kind of their throwaway game over the course of their two week or week long stretch run of, of important games. Uh, it definitely factors in. Um, you know, you saw a confidence coming out of the midfield. You saw, uh, you know, three of the more versatile players who could, you know, really play. You know, each of them can at least play two of those uh, three positions. Um, you know, and the confidence running through the team where you didn't have a, a fullback trying to run into centre midfield because the space had been vacated. You had the wingers kind of going in the positions you wanted them to. Um, I'm not sure I'd put too much on it being 
you know, just the midfield on in itself as much as just you know, this is this is what a confident team does and you know, it's it was one of those like banana skin games like uh, the New York Red Bulls game when they played Red Bulls 2 and uh, what, end up winning 3-1. Uh, instead, they could only beat what was in front of them, and they actually did that. So, um, you know, it, it's it's definitely encouraging to have guys like uh, Tessman and Acosta where you can do that flip uh, 25 minutes in to say things aren't necessarily working out right. Yes, it would have been uh, would have been a little more little a little better if uh, there was maybe some more positionally correct uh, a more positionally correct uh, defensive midfielder in there that Eric Williamson goal was a, a great example because when you watch the run and uh, the you know the, the the curve of the run and and the two one twos with Diego Valeri they they really picked where there would be a gap in the midfield so uh, buzz the big surprise in the starting lineup uh, especially because we talked specifically about this in the previous episode was the fact that Hara did not start and Ricardo Pepe did oh yeah golly that was uh, I was flabbergasted I honestly thought there was no way in hell that that would happen clearly I was wrong uh, I, I've heard through the grapevine that Lucci decided that on Friday um, one of the things that's interesting about Lucci compared to other coaches is that he will experiment during the week. And that was clearly on display today. And I'll talk about that later, but um, he will experiment during the week with lots of different options. And then on Friday, he tends to roll out what he looks like is going to be the starting lineup. But I've even seen a Friday session, you know, go to Saturday and still change. So he changes as late as any coach we've ever seen here. So late in the week, he decided Pepe was the answer. Uh, and I thought Pepe was terrific. Now, he didn't score, of course, but the, the big change for me was that he ran a high line and, and pressed the center backs. And with his movement, he, he put the center backs under stress and pulled them out of position occasionally. And that high line allows both wingers to play off of him and go by him and that kind of layoff activity. Uh, and then even just laterally when he was pressing, like side to side, they come out of ground, he recovered. He made 27 defensive pressures, which was the top on the team, tied for the top on the team. So the work rate is there. The pace is there. The side to side is there. You know, everything you want short of the goal. Uh, there remains a big problem with SC Dallas that he only had 23 touches. And then Hara came in and only had 10. So combined, only 33 touches is lower than you would like, I think, at home from your nine type striker. Both of those guys are your, your leading XG dudes on the team. Mm -hmm. You want the ball at their feet in danger spots. So as a collective front line of SC Dallas, all aren't getting enough touches. This is all part of the bigger issue for Dallas over the last two years, even is they've got to get the ball into those guys more frequently uh, in good positions. Of course, you don't want to do it in the middle of nowhere, but um, I, I thought Pepe was great. And everything I saw in that game to me says he should keep starting. But do you think he will? Well, let's do that later when we get to the part about next okay. week. How about that? No, that's fine. I love a good good tease, Buzz. Credit to you for uh, that proper presentation uh, skill set there. Um, okay, so uh, the game's going really well. The first half, Dallas is dominating. They're scoring goals. They're keeping goals out. Uh, and then Gio Savarisi makes some significant changes to start the second half, and suddenly Portland is rolling out their big guns, and the game suddenly takes a very different tone and feel. And I wondered how much different the result would have been had Portland rolled into town and dropped their starting 11, their proper starting 11, uh, from the get-go. I mean, I have to think it would be very different, don't you? I mean, the, the four guys they bought off the bench at halftime were ridiculous. I mean, it's Diego Valeri, Darian Espria, Juan Carlos Van Rankin, and Eric Williamson, who were four really outstanding players, and three of them for sure are, th are three of their best players. So, I mean, that was the firepower coming. Oh, and then the Bobasi came in a little bit later. So it's like, good grief. I mean, if, if Portland is such an excellent team, if they roll out their first team, if they're not in the middle of a Swamp Champions League schedule, it's a totally different scenario. Now, you're at home. Dallas is at home. Portland hasn't won in Dallas in a long time, but it is a very different game. But, you know, you play the teams you play when the schedule says you schedule them, and it was their decision to rest everybody 
with their eye on the Champions League. You can't blame them for that. You know, this is a team that you got to take care of, and they did. So credit to Dallas for putting them away because they did put them away pretty good pretty early. All right, but Dan, I'm going to ask you to be the uh, the reasonable person here. Just how excited should the fan base be based on the result from from Saturday night? Uh, in, in general, very excited. It was a win is a win at the end of the day, particularly uh, you know, uh, particularly when there was a little bit of pressure of being the last of the three now three Texan teams to uh, pick up a result going into the only home Texas derby. And um, really what what needs to be a stretch of, of games you win with, um, I think, Minnesota home and away, RSL, and a couple other uh, games that, you know, you, you would expect a result on. Um, you know, if you, if you kind of rolled over against Portland after what, on the balance of things beforehand, looked too favorable games that you only got a point from, that's when you, you know, that's when the whispers start coming out and the the little Lucci out comments in on social media and all that stuff. And, you know, and the players do see all that. that that's just added pressure that they don't need. Oh, they were already out <laughs> after two games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, the other thing that I thought was uh, uh, kind of what we expected, but was good to see was that the old Ryan Hollingshead was back when he was on his more natural left side of the field. And then you add into the fact that you got to see the, the full debut of Mr. Manjoma, uh, in the same game, and that was one of the more interesting aspects of something to watch over the course of that 90 minutes. I thought Menjoma was a pretty good start. You know, the team defense needs a little work, but he attempted to get forward a little bit. He didn't do it enough. He didn't do it like Ryan did it, but that's fine. It's his first start, you know. That's it's a good first start. It's not too bad. Ryan on the left, of course, was phenomenal. Uh, Lucci says he wants him to play both sides. Okay. Ryan had a quote in the post game where he said that Lucci's talked to him about it and he wants him to be the best at both sides. I, I, I don't know how you can watch what happens when he's on the right and think that it's any good at all. I mean, to me, it's an utter disaster when he's on the other side. And maybe I'm just completely spoiled by how good he is on the left, but I don't, I don't, I don't know how you could possibly watch what happened and think, Oh yeah, I'm good with Ryan on the right. Anytime I want, uh, it was a mess. Thing is, I mean, it'd be good with Ryan on the right if if you said, okay, ten games he's playing ninety minutes on the right hand side because you know, you know, two or three in he's going to be playing fine. But the whole notion of well, he might start on the right this week and finish the game on the left. He might start the game next week on the left and finish on the right. I mean, he's admitted it before. I know, you know, the quote at the weekend was kind of more like Lucci pleasing than anything. But he said before, if you change mid game or if you change one game to the other. Suddenly he's looking over the wrong shoulder. He's leaning. He's you know leaning his run to the wrong side. He's playing the ball off the wrong foot, expecting the tackle to come in, and it's just it becomes a mess. It, it becomes disjointed. It stops him contributing to the attack, which then in turn turns the ball over, and you know, and, and then he's struggling to to get back even on a defensive role. So to ensure that Ryan is playing in the natural and proper left side. Lucci has to have a solution for the right side. And what I'm wondering, Buzz, is can you make a comparison and a contrast to Manjoma to his predecessors in um, in both Brian Reynolds and Reggie? And, you know, where is his level of potential? What are his strengths and weaknesses in comparison to those two kids that came before him? Well, he's a very offensive-minded outside back. Um, he was so good at SMU that they basically vacated the whole right side of the field and just let him have, like, half the field by himself. Um, he reminds me right now of where Reggie was right when Reggie first started to start, uh, you know, after that the season before Reggie had like one minute of play. And then the next year he was the guy. He, he, it feels like that he and Reggie actually, to me, have a very similar skill set. I think Reggie's upside's a little higher. That's why when Ed, Eddie was in the academy, he played left because Reggie was on the right. And that's why Reggie was a pro one year in and, and Eddie was in four years you know, Eddie's more likely to be a guy who's going to play his whole career in MLS if he gets it. The problem for him right now is that Emma Tuomasi is now healthy and Emma Tuomasi is the other person in that spot. And so those guys are basically going head to head. And Emma has a lot more experience in general. And Emma is a better passer than Eddie is right now. Eddie's a good crosser, but right now Eddie's not good at these sort of tic-tac combos that Dallas likes to do when he gets forward. 
So that's his biggest area of development offensively and defensively. It'll just be team concepts. But, you know, in training, for example, Hedges talks to him constantly when he's paired with Hedges about positioning, you know, and, and just like Hedges did with Reggie and just like Hedges did with Brian. Hedges is as much of a coach and a teacher to those guys on that right back spot as anybody is on that franchise. There was one thing uh, on the post game uh, press conference because for some reason they gave us three players. Uh, but um, Eddie and Brisson, I think maybe actually everyone said it. Um, you know, Eddie's been kind of mentored by Brian and, and Reggie. Even when he was at SMU, he was still kind of you know talking regularly with Reggie and saying that you know they are they are pretty similar in in their gameplay. You know. That's that's not a bad uh, little bit of mentoring to have to kind of have that first hand, well, that second hand experience of what he's already going through now. Yeah, the profile on Eddie is just is very similar to Cannon. He doesn't have Brian's incredible pace and massive upside. Stylistically, you'll see he'll he'll be basically a lot like Cannon was when he was uh, Re- Reggie was here. And then obviously a couple of other highlights uh, from the game against Portland was uh, they continued improvement and growth in Paxton as he came on and played some solid minutes and, and had a, uh, a particular moment that we'll talk about here in a second. But uh, you can clearly see that Paxton's starting to uh, feel it a little bit again. Yeah, every time we see him, he looks a little bit better, right? I mean, he's a guy coming off of a major injury. Half of it is mental. Half of it is physical. I, I just I love the baby step progression we're seeing, and it's just a matter of time before we get 100% old packs and back. I mean, we're already at least like 95% old packs and back. So, um, so hold it together physically, and, and things are going great. Now, the moment that I'm speaking of, and th- I was really delighted that this got highlighted across uh, multiple different national uh, pundit accounts, Doyle in particular, uh, was the the video of how the final goal comes together and Paxton's kind of you know, uh, looking over his shoulder and scanning the field two or three times before he makes this really sweet little pass to Hara, um, and which ultimately culminates in Dante Seeley's goal, which was fantastic, and the crowd just could not have loved that entire sequence uh, any more than they did on Saturday night. Yeah, the interesting thing for me about the whole thing with Paxson is that he came in at left wing, which is what I've been talking about a lot. Now, Paxson plays it at like a false swing and he kind of moves all over the place. And that's so same as Vargas. So they're keeping the same profile in that position. That outlet pass from Paxton was typical Paxton. And that's exactly the kind of pass we've seen him make loads and loads of times of a longer outlet pass, which is one of the best qualities about him when he plays deeper like that. And you got to give Hara some credit. I think he spun that with the outside of his right foot back, didn't he? I mean, it was a really lovely ball yeah. to mm, Seeley. Yeah. And for the kid that's, is he barely 18? I think he's 18 and, yeah, he's just barely 18. Uh, to not panic and settle and put that in the goal as a really lovely sequence. And it, when you when you get a goal late like that to put the game away, the crowd's going to go bonkers. That was a lot of fun. And just the fact that Sealy took a touch to set himself first because the temptation there is, oh, I can just smash it in and watch it hit the Hall of Fame sign. Brian Acosta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have a feeling uh, that Paxton took a lot of personal pride in that particular moment because that, that to me is quintessential Paxton Pomacall soccer is that little tiny moment where he gets a nice little ball and instantly makes something and, and creates or begins the creation of something. And, and that to me is really a, a real forte to his game. Uh, it was good to see him uh, play that uh you know playing well and that was what like 90 seconds after he made that long busting run down the left wing put the ball across the face of goal there was that yeah. uh half-hearted penalty appeal yes yes <laughs> you know to, to recover back for that and you know how far he tracked back for it i mean he's definitely getting his fitness a little bit yep uh, and again, uh, how did because it's the first time that we've seen them, and yes, I wasn't pleased that it happened at home. Any uh, any comments about the powder blue kits for the first time? Well, I'm with you that generally speaking, I don't want to mess with my home uniform, but I, I understand that they want to roll it out one time. I, I get that. I think they look spectacular. I mean, I, I wish that it was full NATO with the white shorts and red socks, but um, mm-hmm. at, just to have the, the change kit not be white, to me, that's just a massive leap forward. I know other teams have powder blue, but um, you know, outside of the context of a bunch of teams doing powder blue, those are great kits. I just think they look terrific. You know, my one observation from the crowd was I can I could 
I feel very confident that I could say this was the this is the fastest adoption of a new FC Dallas kit, uh, as at least represented by who's wearing what in the crowd that I can remember in a very very long time. The only criticism is that the the red numbers are a little hard to read. Yeah, for some reason I don't know if they need a okay. white trim or something or you know. It's because I've got that cut out in the middle. If they were solid, they would be. Mm. a lot easier to read. Yeah, I think the yeah. font has a uh, plays with it just a touch. It is a, a little bit light of a red, uh, you know, the thinness of them and Yeah. but that's a that's a, a minor cuz the red just looks too good in general on there for it to be switched to a navy or a black or something else. Let's just be thankful red's even an option. Yeah, no. I I I, I couldn't agree. You know, I thought the red numbers on the white shorts when they played in San Jose looked great too, by the yeah. way. Oh yeah, totally. Because the there? I think the shorts had or wait did the shorts have red stripes and blue numbers or blue stripes and red numbers? I don't remember. They have white stripes. The white shorts did? No. Uh, no, the blue. Oh. Yeah. He's talking the about white... the white ones. I'm, oh, no. sorry. Uh... I'm talking about the white shorts that they wore in San Jose. They either had blue stripes with red numbers or red stripes with blue numbers. I don't remember which, but uh, whatever it was, it looked good. My brain says it's the blue, it's red numbers with blue stripes. That's what I thought. That's yeah. what I thought too. But I could be wrong about that. All right. Anything else about uh, Dallas four Portland one that we want to talk about before we move on to? Oh, I got Houston. one thing. Yeah, I got one thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mentioned earlier that Pepe had twenty seven pressures, which was tied for the most on the team. I want to see if you guys, if you didn't read the breakdown, could guess who had the um, other person with twenty seven defensive pressures was. Uh, I'm going to assume it is Obreon. Dan? I did read the breakdown. Oh, did you? Terrible memory. Mm. The answer is Andres Ricarte. That's what I said, right? Right. I was right. Yeah, no, you said, <laughs> you said Obreon. <laughs> oh, no, but I think you misunderstood me. Yeah, I, I totally. Andres Ricarte. Yeah, yeah. Andres Ricarte. Well, yeah. no, I just wanted to give him some love because, A, right, he's a playmaker, right? Even though we talk about him as a deep eight, he's still like a playmaker, a passer. Two key passes, 76% passing, right? Two dribbles, great. Nine recoveries and 27 defensive pressures. So he's doing some serious work in midfield as more of a higher kind of player, not as a six. So, um, he was a phenomenal performance. Could have been man of the match if you if you liked. Six for seven on long passes. Just a really great game across the board. And the 27 defensive pressures to me is uh, remarkable for a guy who's a magician, right? The ma- ma- magic man or whatever they call him. Yeah, you know, Ricarte is such a, an interesting story for me because, I, you know, we and I got sucked into this whole idea that he was the new Mauro Diaz, too. Um, uh, and, and I know I shouldn't have, and, and nobody else should have either. Ricarte is a wizard in his own very special way, and it's not the Mauro Diaz way. It, it's, it's a little bit more subtle and far more stealthy than Mauro ever was. Oh, very much so. And you can think of guys that are deep midfield passers, you know, like the, the names that jump out to me would be like a Zabi Alonso, you know, who's a famous guy that plays that way. I'm not saying he's that guy. Everybody settle down. I'm just saying stylistically, you know, Tanner could be that guy. Tanner's capable of that being that good of a passer. He's not yet because he's still a kid, but um, you know, that kind of quality to link play from back there and to distribute back there, hit guys on the break from back there, especially in the, in the modern SC Dallas system, which doesn't use a 10, that, mm-hmm. that guy's a perfect fit for this system. Well, good three points, and now we move into the first of the uh, Texas Derby, or I guess we're going to talk about the, the new Texas Cup here in a little bit. But uh, Houston comes to town for a 2.30 Saturday start uh, in, in Frisco up at Toyota Stadium. Uh, Buzz, I'm going to assume, based on just kind of how this happens historically, Lucci's going to roll out the exact same starting 11, considering how well it went against Portland, right? Uh, probably. I think it's probable. Uh, let's, let's first start with, um, Matt Hedges and Jimmy Maurer. Cause those are guys are big, big parts of this team, right? They both took part in training today. Maurer did all the keeper work up until they got into open play. And then he stepped out. That's probably just precautionary more than anything. And then Matt Hedges took part 100% across the board and in, in all the work. Now, uh, when I watch him run today, I can tell that he still has a level of discomfort. You know, when he occasionally cuts, he's a, there's a grimace on his face. There's an occasional sort of half step. He looks like a guy coming off of an ankle injury. But based on what I saw, for the most part, Hedges took part in the second team. 
Now he rotated in some, but I think it's, I think, so I think he's bench available because he looks like he's 95, 96%, which mm-hmm. for Hedges is better than most people. But it looks like the, since Lucci's going to keep the 4 3 3, because they were in it the whole day today, 100%, you know, two center backs, it's going to be Rasan and Martinez with Hedges as, you know, a bench option if they need him, uh, which is not surprising because A, Okay, give Hedges one more week to lay off. That's fine. That's good. Older recovery time for an older guy. That's fine. And those other two guys were good last game. You were right that it was Ryan. It was Munjoma. This midfield triangle was the same. Uh, Tanner, Acosta, Ricarte. There is something. The interesting part about watching that is that when, through, the, through the play, Tanner and Acosta were always in a single six situation, but they kept flipping. They kept sliding in and out. So it was almost like they were, you know, rotating in that spot, even in the middle of like a single sequence of play. Ricarte was always higher, but um, those two guys kept, which was fascinating to me. That's a very high level operation for, especially for Tanner, who's younger. And then the one interesting thing left is Obreon and Vargas, of course, but Pepe got the first run with the first team again. And, but Hara really quickly was swapped in. The amount those guys swapped in and out today screamed at me that, Lucci's hasn't decided which one of those two guys is starting. So knock on wood or whatever you want to say, the prediction right now is same 11, probably maybe with the exception, possibly being Hara versus Pepe. You know, I, I meant to, I should have included this back when we were talking about the Portland game. Um, you know, I, one of the oddities of the Portland game was for all of the goodness that happened. I do have this weird nagging feeling that I'm not quite sure I yet understand how good or what how much we should feel good about Vargas and Obreon overall like there's parts to their games that I think are really good and then I kind of sense that they disappear for stretches uh in the first three games yeah I don't know if Dan will agree with me or not but Obreon there's definitely uh, a teammate connection problem in terms of like not knowing which way to go and read your teammates whether it's a game or whether it's in training he'll often be like, make the pass or make the move. And the, the player, the other guy will be like, what? Oh, no. you know, they're trying to figure out, learn each right. other. And Vargas, when he, in the spring, Vargas, it reminds me of the, a couple of years ago when Mascara tore it up in the spring and they were playing some bad teams, you know, and even the MLS teams they play weren't that great. And then they, now they've gotten into this team, into the season. Colorado's a pretty good defense. San Jose is a pretty good defense and Portland. Well, generally is a pretty good defense. And Vargas is struggling a little bit against those teams. But I think there's potential there. Now, Obreon on the right is going to be the guy. But Vargas on the left, Paxton very soon is going to be in that mix. Khalil el is probably in that mix based on what I saw today. And for sure, this Shone kid probably is going to be in the mix there. And probably Jesus could be and Pepe could be. So uh, the, Vargas is probably the most tenuous guy in the starting 11 at this point, frankly. Yeah, I, I did find it kind of interesting. I don't know where – I saw somebody quoted on social media. I don't know where this is source from, but apparently Vargas was quoted as saying that you know his his favorite part of his game is taking defenders on 1v1, and I think to myself over these last three games that's actually been his weakest point uh, so far. Although we saw him do it well in the preseason, it hasn't yeah. gone quite as well. In this. And the thing with Obreon to me is you know the goal was fantastic. It was so much fun. I mean the, the goalie assist um, – uh, uh, type goal and the way that he took it was all top notch and that's a cool trick. I just I I haven't yet figured out if Obreon's got more than that one trick in his tool belt, um, uh, and and that's where I think there's a little bit of, of mystery there. Well, the Vargas was over five in duels, uh, you know, in, in dribbles in the last game was the reason why we, we pulled out that comedy made. But Dan, I don't know if you agree with me that Obreon looks to me like exactly like early days Castillo, trying to figure it all out with his team. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that was that was kind of what we were talking about in the press box during the game. Um, you know, and an element of uh, Barrios in those first six months before he kind of just clicked in that uh, Oklahoma City U.S. Open Cup game. Uh, you know, and I, I was it kind of reminded me of something Reggie said um, when there were some little teething issues between him and, and Barrios. He said, "You know, I've got to learn Barrios' runs." You know more than he's got to learn my movements because I've got to know when to go, when to stay, when to allow him to get to cut inside and things like that. So 
you know, hopefully it's not a case of just Obreon learning the team as much as the team also learning Obreon's game. Yeah, and I and I also want to put into context that if you take the Vargas signing and what we've seen out of three games, I certainly personally feel way better about Vargas than I did in the first three games I saw Santiago Mascara or um, Giassi or any number of guys this team has tried to sign to play left wing that just were immediate flops. Uh, Vargas, there you can tell uh, there's something there. He's still just trying to figure it out. I think he falls in very much into this FC Dallas mantra of buy guys that are in their low twenties and try and develop them. You know, they, mm. they don't think Vargas is going to walk in and start like Obreon, who's 25 Vargas is 21. So it's shown 21 Paxton, 20 kid out of college, Khalil. Those guys are all right about the same age. They're all in a battle of that spot. You know, so let's see who can develop. There's probably going to be a share of time in a lot of those for a lot of those guys over the course of the season. So I, I'm not at all worried about either one of those guys. I think they have, obreon has got plenty to do well in MLS and Vargas, I think has got a lot of potential. The mainly the thing I like about Vargas is he carries himself in a way that I really like. What I mean is like his attitude, his mentality, his doesn't show any nerves. It's just super positive. I just yeah, love the I way, agree. you know, the, there's a vibe off of that guy that I really find good. Paxton has the same vibe. Mascara never did. Mascara was yes. always, yeah, you know what I mean, right? Check the body. Just consider yeah. do a do a comparison of the body language of any particular game of Santiago Mascara and and any of the body language of Mister Vargas over these three games, and tell me you can't see an immediate difference just in body language between yeah. those two guys. Totally, absolutely, and that's the thing about Vargas I like the most is that the, that mentality, that expression of himself in the game and on the field to me stands out as like, dude, this guy's got so much self-belief. I love that. Yeah. Particularly when he has the talent to back it up too. You know, the, my worry with him is going to be body size. Not that he's fat. He's not, he's just not small in the heat in Texas, you know, wear and tear banging. Cause he bangs on people too. And they bang on him. So that'll be what to watch over the summer with that guy. All right. Now you've mentioned his name a couple of times, but we should officially introduce to the uh, pod listener because he's now here. Mr. Shablox Schoen from Hungary, uh, who is coming here from a, a Budapest team uh, via the IX youth system. And I know that I butchered his first name, but I'll get it right eventually. Yeah. Well, here's the instant scouting report on that dude. He can sit on a metal bench like a veteran champ. Oh, and when no. he runs a lap around the field, mm, that's a great lap. Oh, no. <laughs> I, that's just a joke because that's what he did today. Today was his first day because they, they had an oh. introduction and everybody <laughs> clapped and said, yay, welcome to the team. And then he did he did like the little jog back and forth cone drills and the like strength and conditioning stuff. <laughs> and then they had him watch the scrimmage part, you know, and then he ran jogged around the field a couple of times. And then they had him do some more sort of strength and conditioning stuff on the side. So it's it looks like a dude, the, the, way, the way they treated him was like, this guy just walked off a plane. It's his first day. Let's get his feet moving a little bit. And you can watch how we play, soak it in. Like He didn't take part fully in training. So I, I can give you absolutely nothing about his ability. I just It was just fun to take a picture of him when he was running around the field and be like, Hey, well, look, he's here. So uh, could you tell us about his body language? Bro? Yes. His body language was a, a 20, 21, 20 year old kid. Who's and amongst the team. He doesn't know anybody and probably can't speak the language. <laughs> he looked a little <laughs> bit like, Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> but intense. He didn't have an, int even when he was running around the field, he looked like he's like, okay, I'm going to go to work now. You know? So I did like that for the 10 seconds. He did that. I mean, it's, it's funny when you started <laughs> talking about sitting on a bench and running a lap, I, I was, I can't remember the player, but I, and I wish I could recall the name, but I do clearly remember there was an instant scouting report from you that you put on your blog at the time of some player that Dallas had signed that was so bad on day one you crapped all over the dude, and he turned out to be an absolute flop, and I don't think we ever saw him. So that's what I was worried you were headed towards when you oh. started it that way. Mm, I don't know. Do you remember yeah. who I'm talking about? I remember the kid that was so bad he tried to walk home to the hotel in his, in his uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that guy. That's the, and uh, the, the Charlie Brown sad music played the yeah. entire way, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the other story I say about, like, uh, that I tell about looking for a trialist was showing up one day expecting some guy. Uh, this was at the uh, Green Hill. 
expecting some guy from Venezuela or something. And I was looking at like, there's a small guy in the middle that's lighting it up, darting back and forth, making sweet passes. And after the training, I was, so it's coach Durr. I was like, oh, man, is, is the little guy in the middle, is that the guy from Venezuela? He looked fantastic. He's like, no, that's Ramon Nunez. He's 15. He's from here in town. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa, sign that guy. Yeah. Ramon Nunez. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, you got a special treat today at Training Buzz. Uh, well, yeah, Kenny Cooper showed up for a visit. That was kind of nice. Uh, you know, he's mostly working as a personal trainer these days for, for individual training. He's got himself a YouTube channel and an <laughs> Instagram where he puts out training videos for people. You know, he's doing that kind of stuff. So it was nice to chat with him. And, and you know, we talked for about 30 minutes and he was like, man, I want to get right out there. I was like, <laughs> I was like good, because Horace stinks. You can take his spot. <laughs> but you totally nice said to, that to him, didn't you? No, I, I did ask him what he thought of Hara, And he kind of was like, well, well, I haven't really seen very much. I was like, okay, yeah, because he stinks. <laughs> you know. Buzz, do you, I mean, uh, Dan, were you around in the Kenny Cooper days? The second spell, yeah. Oh, not the first spell. Not not the good one. No. Not the- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not the good one. <laughs> not when he uh, played as a striker instead of a uh, not quite left or, and right winger. Well, there's a little more to yeah. that story. Uh, mm. That was that was more Kenny dreaming of him thinking he was Nani and less admitting to the world and himself that he was really more Duncan Ferguson. Well, it's always nice to catch up with Kenny, Peter, you know, this, he's one of yes. the most genuinely likable, joyous. Absolutely. I've never seen him frown. I've never seen him in a bad mood, you know, just a wonderful guy uh, to, I mean, I, and I can't say that about a lot of players that they're all joyous like that. And Kenny is always joyous all the time. He's got two kids at home. Things are going well for him. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, how the Patreon works. He was interested in hearing about that because of the work he's doing with the training videos and stuff. So, um, you know, he's trying to put it together, what he's doing next. And I think he, from what he told me, it sounds like things are going well for him. So that was really well, cool. Well, and just to, just to throw in for some context for people that, you know, weren't around back in the day, you know, this uh, Kenny predated the academy. And so the idea that a local kid, especially one whose father directly has ties to the longer history of the club dating back to the Dallas Tornado, his father, Kenny Cooper Sr., uh, able to come up through playing at a high school level and then going overseas and playing at Manchester United in their uh, reserve system and then coming back and playing for his hometown club. That was a really, really big deal back at the time that that happened. Oh, it was huge. Huge. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely a guy that would have come through the academy. I mean, I think there's no question. I mean, there's a oh, whole yeah. bunch of... absolutely. There's whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of guys... You know, even through the great Texans teams, there's some guys that really could have benefited from an academy connection from a North Texas pathway. I mean, Cooper's one for sure. I don't think he ever really got a fair shake at Man U. Uh, Jonathan Villanueva is one of the other ones that went to Virginia and just was like, what's college soccer going to do that guy? You know, I, there's a whole bags full of guys that could have really benefited from the academy that didn't exist at the time. All right, so uh, Buzz, I know that you've had your head turned. And by the way, Dan, the artwork for last week's uh, episode was chef's kiss i loved it thank you sir thank it was you. exactly what i wanted um but it does say here in fiery red cherry red <laughs> crayon that you have is some it scented it, it it may be scented crayons that you have uh, some thomas roberts news oh, yeah thomas tommy roberts. too now remember thomas is coming off of an injury uh as is paxton of course and he and paxton basically now are both in the same boat they both uh lined up as second choice eights effectively today, both like they were in the alternate team with the, um, in the Ricarte and Acosta or Tanner role, whichever one it happens to be playing as an eight that minute, but they both rotated in. They both got extensive runs with the first team group, uh, as part of Lucci's experimentation. And that puts Pat, that puts Tanner, not scared, gracious. That puts Thomas. I got too many kids I like in the midfield on the same level basically as Pax and in terms of the rotations he's getting, the looks he's getting as he comes back into fitness. Uh, so it seems like to me that Lucci's considering him now in that same sort of vein where Paxson is in terms of now we haven't seen him yet, of course, so he's not with Paxson completely, but he definitely is getting those rotations with the first team now. And hopefully that means that we'll get some minutes from him soon. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out exactly where Thomas's career is. I mean, there was lots of rumors that he may go overseas on a trial, and there was some Scottish team stuff, and 
you know, he wasn't really he you know, he he was kind of he wasn't tearing it up for North Texas and then he started to really show at North Texas. I, where do you think like where is that kid's career at at this point? Well, he was a little discouraged last year, uh, obviously, towards the end and was looking for opportunity. He is now in his third year, which is kind of when that third year was when a lot of guys start to really get some traction. Third year as a pro, you know, and you start to see some things happen for him. Now, I, I, I've heard through the grapevine that prior to the season that he and Lucci had a come to Jesus meeting. If you know what a come to Jesus meeting is, Dan, you made another expression. Oh it's, yeah, I'm fully aware. Yeah. Sort of where they sort of sat down. I have a feeling, I have a feeling Dan's had several of those in his life. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've been the person saying come to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, essentially like what I hear through the grapevine is that they sat down and hashed it out. And the reason he has not gone somewhere is Lucci was adamant with him that no, you're in the mix. Remember they turned down a Byron loan for him last year to keep him because Lucy right. wanted him here. And so I think we're in and that then same didn't use him and they didn't use him, which is a subtle screw job in a lot of ways that the kid had a chance to go to Byron. You said, no, no, stay. And then didn't play a minute. So we're going to see, but I'm just saying that like, so I, I feel like Thomas right now has bought in again with probably with a little bit of like, okay, you burn, burn me once. Shame on me. Right. Burn me twice. Shame on you. So, um, I think he's probably a little bit cautious, but from watching the rotations today, I really do think Thomas is in the legit mix to contribute. And I hope that this is going to be the time he actually starts to get some minutes because the kid, now he came out of the Academy as a pure 10. And so he's had to do some adjusting and some learning to play as more as an eight. And he really has worked on that defensive side of his game, uh, particularly when he was with North Texas. So I'm optimistic for Thomas that this is going to be the third year. It's going to be the breakthrough. We're going to see him actually get into Lucci's mix. Okay. It really needs to be because he's on a three and two deal, right? Uh, I'd have to look real quickly, but that, you know, it, more than likely it's a three and two uh, that, cause that's what most homegrown deals are. All right. Uh, and, and before we uh, move on to other stuff and any other injury updates that we need to worry about before we, uh, b- before the Houston game. Uh, it's not an injury update, but just that Paxton looks, um, you know, sharper again. Like every time I see him, he looks sharper and more confident. I think that he's probably three weeks away from being a legit starting consideration, maybe even two weeks away. Um, you know, cause you want to get not, you want to get him to where you can feel like you can get 70 minutes out of him if he starts and you want to feel like he's a hundred percent committed to things he's doing. And also they just want to be careful with him. So, but I do like that every time I see him, um, the other injury concerns really happen at the end of training. Uh, and it's not a concern for a current injury. It's like the kids that haven't played very much did a bunch of extra running at the end. And I just, it was particularly obvious the guys that have been hurt. So Emma Tuamasi, and I was surprised at Evan Cerillo. Then I remembered that remember when he went to Byron, he got hurt. And he was out for like a big chunk with uh, something in his leg. And Thomas, of course, had the problem that he just came back from. So those three guys were noticeably wagging in the fitness. Now you're talking about fitness after a two-hour session, then more fitness on top of that. So it's tough. But those three guys, are they're healthy, but they're definitely a tiny bit behind in terms of spring training, season starting fitness which could definitely be, I mean, obviously Emma just got healthy, so that's why he's not in the mix yet. This maybe explains why Edwin, we haven't seen much of him because if he's still struggling to get fit, that could be a big problem. And then Thomas, of course, just came back from injury too, so he wasn't a surprise either. So those three guys, though, need to, I think, need to get pushed it a little bit before they're going to be contributing much because right now they looked a little bit uh, laggard at the end there. All right, I, I, you know, you mentioned Surreal, and that does bring up something from the Portland game I did want to ask uh, both of you. Are, were either one of you surprised that after Portland scores that relatively easy goal, uh, they've been kind of controlling the game with the insertion of these four or five guys that really changed the game, and Dallas is a little bit on their heels. Were either of you surprised that Lucci went to Surreal in that moment? Uh, I was not because he's the only pure six you have on your team. And after that guy dribbled right through the middle, he probably was like, okay, get in there and stop it up and don't let that happen again. Dan, how do you think Cerrillo played? Um, I mean, I didn't notice him too much, which is what I want to see from a six. I don't, you know, if, if I, if a six is always in your, in your view, then uh, they're getting roasted more often than not. Um, It was a little bit 
you know, pleasantly surprising to see him in a way just because Lucci has operated with a, you know, a very short bench of players he's actively going to. So to recognize, you know, you're kind of getting beat a little bit in the midfield now, you know, you do have a recognized six on the bench was, was good. That's good trust in, in Serio, which we want to see. So, uh, you know, and it, it, and FC Dallas did, you know, rest control back of the, of the midfield and the game after that. So it was my first uh, game to attend at home this season. I wasn't able to go uh, on, in week one. And the safe standing is in place. The supporters group is over there. I think that looks really good. Uh, the, them being in a wedge uh, really kind of increases or in, uh, cha- uh, increases the impact that they have visually in the stadium. Um, the empty stage at the north end of the stadium is a disaster. That looks ridiculous to me. It, it you know what it reminds me of, uh, Buzz and Dan. It reminds me of what the stadium looked like when the when the Hall of Fame was under construction. It just looks like now they're building something on the north end mm. of the stadium. Yeah, it yeah. definitely. Yeah, I agree with that. And unfortunately, it's not changing. Like that's what it's going <laughs> to be from here on out. Yeah, I think that's true. I have heard a rumor, however, you know, through word of mouth, that your idea about the trucks has been that it's, it's making its way up the chain of command in the club. Oh, <laughs> so, the blinking, blinking yeah. the lights and honking the horns. Yeah, people are actually talking about it as an idea. So that'll yeah, be fun. Yeah. No promises. That's just what I hear. So they actually got to some people, and they're like, "Oh, well, I don't think about that." You know, it's funny. Related uh, to that was the idea of doing. Um, uh, 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 deep in the heart of Texas during the game. That's an idea that we talked about forever and ever. And then they finally instituted it, and they were doing it right for a while. But I do not like it when they play it as a pre-recorded thing at the beginning of the game in the stadium. Nobody participates with it because one, it's a weird, it's a weird uh, version of the song that they're playing at the open um, that I don't think people immediately identify as deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, and when you had somebody out on the field doing it, and when they originally were using the guys from uh, one of the supporters groups that played the trombones to do it, that was really the perfect uh, implementation of it. And now it just seems kind of hokey and weird, and I'm frustrated by it. Yeah, it was it was one of those organic things that FC Dallas took and uh, drove into the ground, you know. Um, the supporters groups, well, Lone Star Legion at the time, now they're gone, and... Uh, and Dallas Beer Guardians are doing it in the in, in the thirty sixth minute um, of every game, and you know they wanted to get more people on board. So said so to FC Dallas, you know, how do we, how can we do this? Can we have like the the words on a board or something? And they were like, well, okay, we'll do it before the game, and then that will get people involved so that they can do it in the thirty sixth minute, and then they kind of put the cart before the horse and just turned it into this really corny thing and. You know, like you say, it's um, the only thing it's really good for is being the time that a TIFO gets raised now. <laughs> oh, well, uh, all good things come to an end, I suppose. And the other news that we got this week is that the uh, Hunts have now announced that they're opening the stadium almost to 100%. Uh, I loved how they pronounced that they were announcing or they pronounced that they were reopening to 100%, except it's not 100%. It's more like 97.6% because for whatever reason, and I don't know why this is because I swear I see other stadiums with people in the front rows, they're going to continue to adhere to not putting people in the front rows of the stadium. What I understand about the stadiums where they have people close down is that those people have to agree to take a COVID test in advance to sit there. So I think Dallas is not going to pay for that. So therefore, Dallas is not going to have those people sitting there. Yeah, other clubs have been uh, doing it, and then supposedly when the fans get there for the test, they're just like, "Yeah, come in." Yeah. Oh, <laughs> didn't hear uh, that part. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, honestly, is it going to is it going to be more than like another couple thousand people, maybe at best? I mean, I, I'm not anticipating more than ten thousand people to be there. I mean, that's that's the funny thing. I was I was looking at um, one of those MLS memes, like Facebook groups, and and someone. Uh, had like posted the announcement and then a picture at a half empty stadium and says well it's not no one's going to notice the difference and I was thinking was yeah that's the same thing every FC Dallas fan said like three weeks ago <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the easiest and lamest joke of all time um, oh, and, and, and and I and you know whatever 
I don't know how many people will show up. I don't know how much uh, people not showing up has to do with maybe people's still hesitancy to be uh, in an open-air stadium in mass numbers or a lack of interest in the team or a combination of those things. I don't know. Uh, but the fact that they are going to go ahead and reopen to 100%, I, I, I largely assume is a perfectly uh, good thing. Um, I, I, I don't think they'll have to worry about it, but it's nice to know that they're, they at least feel like they can get back to doing that. I mean, just, uh, go ahead, Dan. I was going to say, it's just a real shame that, uh, you know, the, the only home Texas Derby this year falls in one of those games where it's a reduced capacity because, you know, granted, um, you know, even if it's just the supporters section, you would like to see that at a hundred percent capacity because, you know, you want you want a noisy, atmospheric, fantastic, uh, you know, display, and uh, you know, not necessarily. You know, uh, don't get me wrong. The uh, the the new section, the Rhine, sounded amazing uh, on Saturday, and I'm sure it will sound even better uh, this this coming Saturday. But you know, it would be great to see that completely full with those over um, overflow sections as well. I love that name, by the way. I mean, listen, oh, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I would be happy to be wrong and have 20,000 people show up. But in season 26 of this franchise, I'm pretty confident it's going to be about 10,000 if we're lucky. Okay. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's like you can make fun of Dallas for that. And we're all like, yeah, we make fun of the team for that, too. It's, like, it's, it's not like it's a shot at us. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, oh. Yeah, that's true. It's not full. I mean, the funny thing, I mean, it's it's kind of like, you know, the same thing people in NBA circles say about the Mavs, right? They announce a, a sellout every single game because they give so many tickets away and nobody uses them. It's, it's just what it is. You know, some teams get great attendances and others don't. And it's not, it doesn't really affect the product on the field at the end of the day. So uh, with this game, it opens up a new intrastate competition cup that this is all fan-generated called Copa Tejas. Uh, I guess it's the version of El Capitan. Hopefully it'll stay in better shape than El Capitan is in. Um, And I guess like the old historical brimstone cup between Dallas and Chicago. So this officially starts with this particular game, and it's, it's whoever collects the most points in the round robin between the three teams over the course of the season, Dan? So it's it's definitely closer to Brimstone than it is to El Capitan. El Capitan was, you know, the supporters at the time didn't move quick enough and the front offices bought the cannon and unfortunately it's now sitting looking ropier and ropier every year. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got a 200-year-old imitation cannon that sits out in the rain and everything and one of the wheels is barely uh, held together with one of the one of those uh, brass bands, uh, you know, they can't fire it anymore. So you'll see at halftime some guy will walk around and drop a little firework in there to go off because, <laughs> you know, either, <laughs> depending on who you listen to, Houston broke the firing mechanism or FC Dallas just won't pay for anyone to be trained to use it. Uh, uh, cracks me up. But Copa Tejas, um, if you don't know, there is the USL Championship uh, tournament that was launched in 2019 between El Paso, Rio Grande Valley, uh, Austin Bold, and San Antonio. Uh, Austin Bold actually won the first one uh, based on the idea of the, uh, on the format of the Cascadia Cup. So just a little league table of all the head to heads. Um, with Austin coming in, this has actually been a, a really great thing because uh, mostly Austin were trying to push this notion of rivalries, but you can't have a rivalry with someone you've never played, right? It's not, you know, maybe Dallas and Houston because the cities have a rivalry, but let's be honest, no one gives a shit about Austin other than Taco Austin. Enthusiast. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... I was speaking to Steve Arter, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the uh, company. He said, you know, when he'd approached the supporters groups, it was kind of, it's a friendly competition, right? And then if within that, it can foster an organic rivalry, awesome. If not, who cares? So the three teams will play, will play for that. The supporters groups of those teams um, 
are currently raising money for the trophy itself. The the groups have raised have put in eighteen hundred dollars between them. There's another three grand that they're looking to raise through a GoFundMe. Uh, I actually have an article up today on the website, so go and have a look at that. Um, there is also a really cool thing they're going to do: uh, the Copa Teja Shield, where they do like a points per game total for all the teams in Texas, even including the Houston Dash in NWSL. Hmm. So uh, we kind of uh, actually get to at least crown uh, a king or queen of Texas, although that is obviously a name that FC Dallas uses only. Is it? Is there anybody past USLC involved in that, Dan? Is it like... Uh, it- no, because no one else has supporters. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's kind of the, the killer to it because there's tons of WPS teams in texas there's you know all the there's a couple of usl2 teams but there's no supporter groups with those two well north texas for that matter you know. well yeah hmm. okay well that looks like fun and i did see a picture of the aforementioned trophy at least the design of it and it does look beefy and very texan um although not not in a stereotypical way it doesn't have horns on it or any spurs or boots or anything so yeah, it might or, do or that they're, they're trying to look for something quintessentially texan to and it's going to be completely custom uh, yeah but nice. i'm saying it doesn't have i didn't see any of those in the mock-up that i saw it was more of a, a proper cup or trophy right yeah, that's just some initial concepts that they've got. They don't have oh. an idea what it's going to look like yet. Oh, I thought that was actually the design they were raising money to to to, to put together. Okay, all right. Well, maybe it'll maybe it'll be a hat on top of a boot with some spurs and guns on it. So uh, we'll just go copyright full Dallas Cowboy. Cup. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was thinking armadillo with a cowboy hat and some six shooters oh, around okay. his waist. Now that oh, one that was, was actually magical. really cool, and they should just make that one again. I did yeah. like that one quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened to that thing? Do you see United won it? What was that trophy again? What was that? What was that cup? Uh, the ATX Pro Challenge when the people behind the Austin Aztecs were trying to show that they were ready for MLS. Ah, uh, okay. And how did DC win it? By beating FC Dallas in the final. Uh, Dallas had beaten It was a Columbus. preseason tournament, right? Yeah, it was Dallas, Columbus, DC, and uh, Austin Aztecs at the time. Well, and it was like a, that idea. It was a taxidermied armadillo on its hind legs with a cowboy hat and a and a and two six shooters in holsters right yes sir oh, that, that'd be perfect yeah can you find an image of that buzz and make <laughs> it the episode art please sure there's, uh, there's one actually on the little media library on the blog we i i think we put it in one of the stories earlier this year oh, oh right. for okay. la capita that was it all right all right, anything else that we need to uh, discuss today before we end this episode of the podcast? Well, just a quick hit. The North Texas is back home on Saturday night. They, they went on the road against the Greenville Triumph as the defending champs and got uh, stomped pretty aggressively. I talked to Quill, and he said that the ball was in the air more than those kids have ever seen in their entire life. <laughs> they were playing did against... I, did I see that they got double reds? Yeah. That was impressive. Yeah. What happened with... The, Eject, was it from the same incident? Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. So, uh, Gibran Rayo, uh, the ball has or gone out of play for a throw. He runs up and kicks the guy um, in the stomach on the <laughs> sidelines. Then there's a brawl, and Kazu runs off the bench, which is on the opposite side of the field, to run over and shove somebody up, down. Then runs back to the bench, then gets sent off. And he had subbed out of the game. He started and subbed out, and so he was on the bench <laughs> and then he ran and, across the field. Good and then Lord. Michelle nearly got sent off as well because he uh, kind of gave the ref a, a, an earful. <laughs> Wait, Afro, like the old school Michelle? Like the yeah, yeah. yeah, he's, oh, he's okay. the assistant coach for oh, North Texas. I didn't, I did not know that. Uh, it's good to, good to hear. Oh, that's the other thing, and we should have talked about this earlier. And Buzz, if you want to edit this back into that portion of the podcast, or you can leave it here. We haven't had a discussion about the whole incident with Ryan and Geo and the ball fake and the yellow card. What did you? I, oh, yeah. I, I, that was the most insane, weird little sequence I, c- I can remember in a long time. And and I I made this comment on Twitter. It's like. 
That's a dude who skipped his rookie season to build a church. What did Geo do to him to get him to, to pull Threw such a janky bit like that? Well, Ryan said that Gio threw the ball at his face, but Ryan was looking, so he caught it or pushed it aside. And so that's why he did that fake throw in it at uh, Gio. I mean, you know, Gio loves to get people riled up, man. That guy oh, yeah. makes people angry. You know, he's, he's not quite Caleb Border, but uh, he gets Well, he's not involved. a dick. Right. He's but just I, a really passionate guy. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I also read that there was something that had happened that got uh, Savarese to do that in the first place. Like, there's some there was some interaction between Ryan and a Portland oh, yeah. player on the sideline that happened in the moments before that that Gio was upset about, which then got him to throw the ball at Ryan, and then Ryan head faked him or whatever. So. Well, it's, you know, when the ball goes out of bounds and Ryan's going over there, they try to toss him the ball, and he just let it go roll away, and he went over and picked up the clean ball off of the little stand uh-huh. they have, you know, cause you, which is probably what you're supposed to do because you don't know who's touched the damn thing in terms of COVID. So they didn't like the fact that he didn't like the ball that they threw at him, and then he went over and got the clean one off the stand. So that's what they were mad about, that that was time-wasting. You know, which <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's like a, yeah, uh, <laughs> it is. It was just funny. I, like, it, Ryan's had a little bit of a feisty level to him this year that I've not noticed before, and it's, uh, it's like a, a new little thing in his game that I kind of dig, and uh, the, that was a funny moment. I mean, the funny thing is, uh, so I asked him about that after the game on the, on the press call, and he was like, you know what, I, I – you know, the guys responded. Everyone got really fired up. It was great. Like, you know, he said that sometimes you just need that bit of personality, that bit of bite. And, you know, we talk about him as a leader, and that's that's being a leader, right? Trying Doing something to fire your team up. Yeah, he's the emotional leader of this team for sure. Yeah, unquestionably. Hmm. What a good guy. I love that Ryan Hollingshead. Well, you know, part of it, too. Left. Part of it, too, is that <laughs> – I know, only on the left. Part of it, too, is that Dallas has a reputation for time-wasting. Even though Jesse Gonzalez, who was the biggest part of that, is gone, people still think of Dallas as a time-wasting team. And I'm sure that they do some fair amount of that. You know, They are a team that has done that a lot in the past. They're not nearly as bad as they used to be. But people are just going to assume the worst all the time because they are time-wasting. I mean, everybody time-wastes. It's part of the game. So, mm, Well, yes. if, you're, uh, if you're like 3-1 up at a time and – you know, not in control of the game. What are you going to do? Yeah. It's typical soccer. I mean, I, I do it. You do it. Everybody does it. Yeah, it's just smart game management. Yeah. Saturday, 2.30 at Toyota Stadium up in Frisco. The hated Houston Dynamo come to town for the start of the Texas Derby Tejas Copa uh, tournament. Uh, we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, I'll be doing a radio show at that time, so I won't be able to attend. But it is on TV, both English and Spanish, thankfully. And uh, Or is it just Spanish this week because it's the 2.30 uh, Saturday game? It's the Univision TUDN broadcast, but I think it's on Twitter in English, as yeah. the, the which is basically the SAP programming. And it's on uh, SAP right. programming on my direct TV yeah, uh, on, the, right. on the Univision TUDN. All right. I'd rather listen to it in a language I don't understand. To be well, the, the, their English version has gotten way better, Dan. I don't know if you've listened to oh, it. it. I mean, last no, year was, gar- I mean, still not amazing, but it's way better than Who, it used to Who's be. doing it this year? I can't even tell you other than it's much better. Uh, it's oh, okay. what they changed one of the two people or maybe even both of them. I can tell that I think the color guy is still the same because he occasionally struggles to articulate in English, you know, which is, I can tell it's not his first language, but I think the play by play guy has changed and it's considerably better. Mm. All right. So it's no, uh, no kicking at the white rectangle in the green square. No, no. I don't know what that. you're talking about. Yeah, I don't either. Exactly. That was a line that they used to come out with mm. constantly oh. for a well, shot on goal. Listen, it's still not. It's not a top tier, but it's definitely better than it was. No, All right. Well, that is at two oh, thirty. Oh, I'm don't sorry. Forget, what? It's Univision, so really it's two fifty six or something. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, right, right. Very, very good point. It'll be closer to three o'clock before the game kicks off. All right. Well, I hope Which everybody is good. you get to catch more of it. Enjoys the game, and yes. Uh, uh, and uh, all, uh, hopefully, we'll get to see all your favorite players on Saturday. All right. Anything else before we close up shop? Going once, going twice. Okay. 
Don't forget the third degree of the podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. New additions to the Since 96 collection. The new era Dallas Burn hat is now available. It is lovely. And this Saturday, May 8th, all North Texas soccer club gear will be per- that is purchased will come with free shipping. And don't forget that you, the third degree listener, receive 25% off when you use the code third degree at checkout at the awesome soccer90.com. All right. Dan, thank you so much. Enjoy the game this Saturday. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Oh, uh, well, how can I not? I'm doing the show. I have to enjoy it. Otherwise, okay. why am I doing it? And Buzz, thank you, sir, for your time, effort, and going out and hobbling. How is the uh, ankle going, by the way, Buzz? Oh, we're almost there. Uh, it's you know, I think maybe another week. I was feeling really good about it, and so I tried to kick a ball at practice today. Uh, that hurt. <laughs> 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 that did not feel good <laughs> yeah I a total visual of that all right yeah. well, thank you buzz i appreciate it man yeah all right and thank you fc dallas curious fan go buy a shirt we'll speak to you next week on another edition of third degree the podcast seriously go buy a shirt now third degree the third degree net podcast third degree the third degree net podcast third degree Third degree nap I can. Third degree, the third degree nap I can.